so we're going to finish up our baptism study. This way, we know exactly what each text uh, in the subject of baptism and all of its cognates, what it's talking about throughout the New Testament. That has been our, our goal. So we know that we have a full-orbed understanding of this subject. Several people have said to me, you know, I'm there with this. I understand. I think I've, I've got it. You know, and I'm saying, yeah, I know, but then they say, yeah, we know you have to finish this. You know, that's right. And so some of this I've already touched on already. I don't need to uh, go into a lot of detail with it. But just especially for those who are listening by CD, uh, because as we've pointed out, we're recording all these things. Let's go ahead and be as complete as we can. So here's what I'd like us to do. Just by way of fast review, let's go to Colossians uh, chapter 2. <clears throat> and we'll start at verse 10. We, f we did this last week. I just want to touch on it because it contains some information relative to this aspect of the spiritual reality of the circumcision of Christ, which Paul here says equates to a baptism, um, a washing. And by the way, uh, the word baptism, um, baptismos or bapto, baptize, I baptize, um, the noun and the verb uh, uh, aspects of it, you know, that can also legitimately be translated lexically as wash. In fact, we see that in a few spots in the New Testament. The, the normal Greek word for wash is luo, uh, first person singular, I wash. Uh, but then many times the word baptism, baptismois, will be used for a washing. And I think we see that in regards to the Ethiopian eunuch. As a matter of fact, and we'll, we'll cover this kind of rapidly next week when we finish up the 8th chapter of Acts, when it says that the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip go down into the water and he's going to perform this mikvah, Jewish cleansing ritual, on this guy, it says that they both went down, uh, the eunuch and Philip, into the water, and Philip baptized him. Uh, baptizo, the verb form. Uh, it probably should be translated as washed right there because that's really what that was. The mikvah was a ceremonial washing. So it should probably just be translated that way. I even, I'd even stick that into my Bible. And Philip washed him. That would be better. You know, a lot of times we have hot buzzwords, you know, in the New Testament. That word baptism is a hot buzzword. You know, it's like we immediately make the uh, intellectual as well as emotional association with that word with water. You know, we don't see it in many other ways. So one faith, one Lord, one baptism, like Ephesians 4, 5 says, there's not two baptisms, not three. There's only one baptism in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in Colossians 2, he makes this statement, and you, verse 10, are complete, all of you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. And who are we talking about here? Who are we talking about? We're talking about Christ. We are complete in him. That means we don't need anything else, certainly don't need anything physical performed upon us. You're complete in him. In, uh, 11, in whom also all of you, are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. There is a circumcision made without hands. Now, he's going to define what that circumcision is when we get down to the bottom of verse 11. He says it's the circumcision of Christ, which verse 12 says buried with him in baptism. But before we run to that, in verse 11 he says you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now, that's important. So immediately he says there is a spiritual circumcision which he is going to equate with baptism down in verse 12, that does not have men's hands attached to it. it, is not something men physically do to one another. So that takes the baptism with water idea completely out of the picture, not to mention the fact that even in this context right here, there is no mention of any agua, is there? No H2O reference is to be found. So in him you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, colon, in putting off the body of sins... That's what this circumcision made without hands does. By the circumcision of Christ. So the putting off of the body of sins. That means the body of sins that you're carried, carried around with you as a sinner, dead in trespasses and sins. This is now put off through what he's about to call being buried in baptism with him. Right. So in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, colon, which is buried with him in baptism. Remember we talked about this word buried last week, sunthapto thum, right there, it means to be co-funeraled or co-entombed, something along that idea. It has nothing to do with being, you know, stuck into a, into a, a vat, you know, going down six feet or a, a picture of, 
of, uh, you know, buried with him as if, you know, I'm going down being buried six feet under the dirt or something like that. That concept was completely foreign uh, to the ceremonialism of the Jews, foreign to the understanding of burial. Uh, within the, the first century format, they entombed one another in, in those days. Um, the, uh, the idea of putting somebody down into the ground uh, was a very dishonorable act. So it's interesting in Matthew 23 when Jesus refers to the Pharisees as whitewashed sepulchers and that men walk over you, they don't even know that you're there. He's talking about, he's, he's kind of doing a double whammy right there. Not only are you whitewashed, you pretend to be godly, but you're actually hypocrites, which he says eight different times to them in Matthew 23. But then he gives an extra little jab when he says men walk over you. There were those who were buried around the hills uh, of Jerusalem from time past, um, from different sieges, and it was a dishonorable thing to have to bury into the ground. It was always entombment. Now, it's true that there were some times when it was out of necessity, it had to be hurried and rushed and that kind of a thing, but in the main, when Jesus says, men walk over you, he's implying that you are so dishonorable, you don't need to even deserve a proper burial. Men will walk over you. You are dishonored because you're buried you know, in the dirt in a dishonorable way. So here, in verse 12 of Colossians 2, he says, Sunthapto, co-entombed or co-funeraled with him in baptism, wherein also you are raised with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Now what's important about this text is A, there's no mention of water in it. That's simple. B, it follows in line with all of the other baptism texts that we've been looking at since John the Baptist, right? And all of those texts that are constantly without H2O. And it's talking about the baptism of Christ, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, which says, uh, by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Uh, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. So it's this baptism of the Holy Spirit, wherein we are placed into the body of Christ. And it's the same idea right here. He just uses different languages. First he establishes, verse 11, it's a circumcision made without hands. Then he defines this circumcision of Christ in verse 12 as a co-funeraled or co-entombed with him in baptism. And in this baptism there is a feature which says, wherein, in this baptism, you are raised with him. Now, nobody is raised with Christ in a supernatural, explicit supernatural, factual sense by coming up out of the water, for instance. All you got is just a wet body. Nothing spiritual has taken place. You haven't been raised with Christ by being dunked into a material element of water and then being pulled out. Um, what he's talking about here is the association that is explained for us between the believer in Christ that's explained to us in Romans, the sixth chapter. Uh, starting at verse 3 and going through at least verse 6, where it talks about the fact that when Christ was what? Crucified. We were crucified with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. And then it says when he was raised, we were raised with him, resulting in a new life. So all of the church was in Christ, being put to death, putting off the body of sins, see, through being crucified with Christ and then being raised with him as Christ had this magnificent and has this magnificent new life right? Um, name above all names, giver of all life, sustainer of all life, in a glorified resurrection state, we share in that. And that's what Ephesians 2, 4 through 6 talks about too, how we've been raised up with him and seated together with him uh, in heavenly places in Christ. This is a spiritual reality. It's a positioning reality that he gives the believer. And he says that happens through the baptism with the Holy Spirit, which is performed by the person of Christ. Anything less than that robs these verses right here of the power of their meaning. See, That's why we, we cannot tolerate, I believe, water baptism cannot be tolerated. And I really, I thank God, you know, that he corrects me like he does. Um, because I, I don't want to be in trouble with him, you know. He scares me. <laughs> you know, he's my daddy, but uh, I respect my dad, and I, I fear him. And so I want to get it right, even if it's not popular. I, you know, he's given me this, this ability to, like, I don't know, I've been punched around so much over my doctrinal stuff, and I'm like, whatever, kind of a routine. But um, in saying that, I mean, it's like, 
Christ will not be replaced by something physical, like a physical substance of water. And we're ripping him off of glory when we push this water situation. <clears throat> we're replacing the true, glorious, powerful baptism with something of a physical element. That's what John the Baptist meant in Matthew chapter 3, for instance. I believe it's verse 16, where he said, uh, I come truly baptizing with water. But, on the other hand, there's something else. He who is coming after me, whose shoes I am not worthy to even untie, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Th that whole context means it's better than water. See, I got this water thing happening, but Jesus has got this spirit thing happening. Let's see. Water, spirit. Which do you think in God's economy is more important? Well, clearly that which is of the spirit. And that's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus in John, the third chapter. You know, um, men must be born of flesh first in order to be born of the spirit. You got to be born of the spirit, born from above. They're mutual equivalents. All right. Any questions or comments about this passage? Let me have you slip over to Titus now, first and second Timothy, and then Titus. We can kind of move through this because we've been here once already, but let's just be thorough. Titus, the third chapter and the fifth verse. Water time. Okay, so I'm preaching about no water, and then I'm taking a drink of it out of a bottle. All right, Titus, the third chapter. Let's back it up to uh, verse uh, 4. Let's do that. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by dia, or through, the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Whoa. Now, we're looking at this now because there is a commonality uh, between the, the usages of uh, oh, baptizo and lu, uh, luo, for instance. Uh, I wash uh, or I baptize. Bap, baptizo can be translated as wash, washed if it's in an aorist tense. Um, that's perfectly legitimate. It's the application of water to the subject, wherein we're normally seeing that the voice is active, like it was in the case of Philip and the eunuch, that the voice of baptize, when Philip baptized the eunuch, was in the active voice. So um, the subject was participating in the action, you see. He was actively being baptized. Uh, whereunto, whenever we see the Holy Spirit baptizing throughout Acts, and we see it on into the epistles, what's the voice in for baptizo, for the, uh, the verbal form? What's the voice always in? It's one of, one of two. Do you remember? Exactly, exactly, passive, and then sometimes middle voice, right? We've seen that a couple times, and we've pointed out to you that grammatically the passive and the middle voice are very similar. It's, it's always the action is performed upon the subject without the subject's involvement. That's why it's so critical. That's why that leaves the physical element of water out of the picture entirely. So when we look at Titus 5, we see an analogy going on. We see a type going on. He says that according to his mercy, that God saves us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, you see the word and there that I emphasized? That's chi in Greek. Um, that's an explanative conjunction that's working right there. In this case, in this construction, it's explanative for the conjunction, and that means it's going to say, it should be like, that is, or in other words. What is the washing of regeneration? Well, in other words, it's the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So it's not two different things that are going on here. He doesn't save us through two different things. He saves us through one thing, which he gives us in an in analogy type of format at the beginning, washing of regeneration. But then he defines it for us. He says, which is, or that is, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So... When you look at regeneration, palingenesia um, means to be born again. Genesia from genia, to be born. Palin, again. It's the washing of born again. Washing of born again. Being born again is like being washed, he says. Um, but clearly, this, is, this passage right here is not talking about bringing water to a person or, or 
uh, bringing them over to the tank or something like that. This is analogous. He's giving us an analogy relative to what salvation is like. There is a washing, there is a cleansing, and sin is always pointed to as that which is a filth of the flesh, you know, and that kind of a thing. We'll see Peter talk about that in just a little bit here. And so he uses the analogy of washing. You know, there's just sometimes, you know, you just, you just need to take a shower, right? Like hopefully most every day, I guess. Uh, but it's like sometimes you'll be like with some people and it's like maybe they're not especially a building folks or something like that. Uh, or you've heard something on the radio and you just go, gosh, I feel like I need to have a bath, you know, that kind of a thing. Well, that's sort of the idea behind this, you know, it's the washing that takes place. It's like the, that filthiness of sin in the world. Regeneration is just like that washing. Every Monday at 5 o'clock I have to take a shower. <laughs> that's, the, that's the end of our show, you know, in the knowledge of the end of 5 o'clock. All right, Stephen, I remember you said that. Thank you, brother. So the washing of regeneration is defined for us with the explanative conjunction, chi, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We are made new by the Holy Spirit. Now, what's important about this right here? When he calls regeneration the renewing, making new, which is performed by the Holy Spirit, there is a direct link here between this idea of renewal of the Holy Spirit and baptism. But it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not through water. Um, For instance, if if you just make a a little note right here, it would be helpful if you put down Acts 2, verse 38 and 39, right after verse 5 there, Acts 2, 38, 39. And just as a little reminder, slip back there before we move on to our next text. You look at Acts 2, 38 and 39. Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. He preaches Christ to them. 37, they're pricked in their hearts. Says unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of sin, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and unto your children. And of course, we pointed out before that there's no material element of water mentioned here. If there was water going on with 3,000 people, it would have taken a day and a half easy nonstop for them to all have water applied to them in that. And that's just physically impossible to have been done in this circumstance, besides the fact that the text won't allow for any type of a scenario like that. But in any case, he says, repent and be baptized. He's commanding this baptism, which I believe is the baptism that Jesus talked about in Matthew 28, 19, when he says to the apostles, um, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the authority of the Godhead. And I think a good argument can be made here, since he never taught about water baptism, is that this baptism is the washing uh, with the word, being baptized with the word, which certainly Ephesians uh, 526 points out, talks about that. We just saw it uh, here, this washing of renewal that takes place through the ministry of the preaching of the word that goes on. But if you look here, At 2.38 and 39, as we talk about this being renewed by the Holy Spirit, it says here in the middle of 38, if you look at, baptize every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness, if you have a King James that says remission, but it's forgiveness, aphesis in Greek. And what we've got here is a noun in the feminine singular. And then it says, and you will receive the gift, duria, noun, feminine singular again, of the Holy Spirit, for the promise, noun, feminine, singular, ipagalia in Greek, noun in the feminine, singular, is unto you. In other words, the promise, work backwards now, each, each one of these nouns modifies one another. For the promise, which is the gift, bottom of 38, of the Holy Spirit, brings remission or forgiveness of sins. In other words, it's the active working of renewal of the Holy Spirit that saves. That brings forgiveness, you see. This is his job. All of the doctrines that the Bible teaches us relative to the propitiatory, substitutionary work of Christ and faith in that that brings forgiveness, what actually engineers that, what what kicks that into gear, is this person of the Holy Spirit that brings about this renewal that instantly results in forgiveness or remission of sins. I love that. And the grammar is real. I mean, it's dead on. It's dead straight. And good luck finding a commentary that says that. Good luck. You're just not going to find many. I had another commentary throwing fit just this afternoon, speaking about throwing books. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I'm studying away in in Acts 8, just like I told you I was doing, right, for next week. I'm studying along in Acts 8, 
and I was just doing some quick review over some uh, information, and I wanted to make sure that I had the, you know, uh, as full understanding as I did, or as I could in regards to 837, you know, that additional verse right there that came, showed up not till like the 6th century in manuscript E, where uh, uh, they've got Philip saying to the eunuch after the eunuch says, look, you know, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized, right? And then it's added, that, that 37th verse, uh, you may, if you believe with all your heart, and then the, the eunuch says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it's a great statement, it's wonderful, you know, but Luke never wrote it. And I'm reading along with this guy, I was actually reading it for something prior to that, but I kept reading, and this guy says, well, what we need to do here is we need to just understand that the whole tenure of all of that's going on right here probably did have the eunuch making some sort of a profession in regards to before, you know, he was baptized right here, which the guy's assuming, you know, is a Christian baptism as opposed to Jewish mikvah ceremonialism, which is the only thing the guy had in his head anyway. Philip never introduced it, any kind of baptism. And then he says this, so what probably have, the reason that we don't have this verse actually in the older, better manuscripts is because probably when Luke was doing the final editing work, now think about this in the terms of of the inspiration of the text for a second. When Luke wrote his autograph, his original writing, inspiration was upon him. The Holy Spirit was carrying him along. So you like 2 Peter talks about, carrying him along, inspiration. All right, so this guy says, probably when he was doing his final editing work, he just crossed out those words and just left it off to the side. We just need to understand that he probably shouldn't have done that. I said, what? <laughs> what? You know, and, and the book, you know, sprouted wings and away it went. Kind of a thing. No, but he's hit, the, he's hit the wall a few times, you know. When you are, when you give yourself the biggest challenge that any student of the Bible can bring to the table, or rather that that is brought to them, it isn't learning Greek, it's not learning Hebrew, that's not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge I find is to let go of those precious prejudices, those precious presuppositions that we all have and bring to the table. Uh, being able to, to recognize you know, what they are that is stopping us from being full-orbed in our exegesis. And what it stops us is it puts us into an interpretive category that we don't like. We're uncomfortable with it. It makes us uncomfortable, and it makes us in the rest of the Christian community look, you know, like we are outside of the pale of orthodoxy or something like that, you know. But that's what holds men to these positions, whatever the position is. You know, that's what keeps them there. And uh, I tell you, nobody that I'm aware of, and it doesn't mean that there, there isn't, maybe I'm just not aware of them, simple as that. Uh, I, I have never, I've been studying this all my life, and it wasn't until I got down and dirty with the grammar here that I began to see, holy cow, it's the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit that brings forgiveness of sins. That's the active energizing factor that brings that about, you know. But, I mean, good luck finding a Bible commentary, you know, that deals with that whole kind of a thing. All right, so that's my take on the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Comments? Questions? Let's go to Hebrews. All right, Hebrews, right next door, right after Philemon, right? I'm going to take you to the 8th chapter. Now, as you know, the book of Hebrews is written by an unknown author. Maybe it was Paul, but I kind of doubt it. Written to uh, a group of Christians that were in the Jerusalem area, very close to the end, according to uh, 1037. Uh, in a very, 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 very little while, he was coming will come and will not tarry. I mean, we were right on the edge of it right here, okay? So he's writing to this group of people that are falling back into Jewish temple ceremonialism, the very thing that God was bringing uh, judgment upon in the form of the Roman persecution for three and a half years from AD 66 to 70. It continued on after that, uh, after Jerusalem fell as well, by the way. But the writer's intention is to show how Christ is so much greater than the temple, than the law, than Moses, than the priesthood, than any of the ceremonialism that is, that is locked up within that whole thing. And his big issue was that you get over into 1025, 1026, he says, don't, now look, man, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a habit of son. some. Because if we go on sinning willfully, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. That means that there's no amount of little sheepies or goaties 
of animal blood that you'll be able to spill that's going to bring forgiveness for this when you uh, stop attending services. It's another way of saying it. You know, He's saying keep in fellowship together. That's your lifeline. That's your anchor. Okay. So as he's getting them into this, he's trying to demonstrate to them that the things in the temple and all of the ceremonies, including washings, which we've already seen in other Old Testament passages, were just shadows. But there's that fullness that is of Christ, like Colossians talks about. So if you look at the 8th chapter of Hebrews, and let's just do verse 1. He says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's Christ, right? Uh, right? Yeah. A minister of the sanctuary, the holy place, and of the true tabernacle. In other words, he's setting in juxtaposition the heavenly tabernacle, which is actually the body of Christ, the person of Christ, in the heavens, as opposed to this fleshly thing that is on the planet, right? A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, watch this, which the Lord pitched and not man. See, once again, think about what we just saw in Colossians 2.11, right? A circumcision made what? Without hands, not of man. And he emphasizes the same thing at the bottom of verse 2, which the Lord pitched and not man. So forget this physical thing. It's not about a location. It's not about a building. It's not about physical things. It's about the spiritual reality. Verse 3, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man, Christ, have something also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should or could not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. And of course, you know, he wasn't of the tribe of, uh, of Levi, the Aaronic tribe. He was of the tribe of Judah. He couldn't have been a priest anyway. But he is the, the Melchizedekian priesthood, priesthood. He fulfills that, which is back in chapter 5, a little bit in 6, and then most of 7. <clears throat> and then he brings it up again in a little bit here. <clears throat> so look at verse 5. So those priests that offer gifts according to the law, to watch, who serve unto the example and, what's the next word? Shadow of heavenly things. The priests that were working in the temple, all of their service, all the things of the ceremony that they would do are shadows, he says, of heavenly things. So there's a greater reality. Now God doesn't save his church and bring them out of uh, the law-keeping ceremonialism of the Hebrews only to bring them into more physical law-keeping, more physical things. Now, we'll just keep going here. Uh, look with me at chapter 10, verse 1 for a second. Chapter 10, 1. For the law having a what? Yeah, the law having a shadow of good things to come, but not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. All right, and then he stresses more of that and then brings us into, uh, brings us into the fulfillment of verse 19 of chapter 10, having boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Christ, which we couldn't do before. You couldn't get into the Holy of Holies in the temple, but you can get into the true Holy of Holies in heaven, and he talks about a new and living way. See, I, I'm emphasizing this for you. We're talking about the place of water within the ceremonialism of the old covenant structure, okay? He calls it now, we're out of that structure in verse 20. It's a new way. It's a living way. It's consecrated through the veil, which is his flesh. See, the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, which the high priest could only pierce through once a year on the Day, day of Atonement, he says that was a type of Christ's flesh, which had to be pierced on Golgotha's hill, you see, through the crucifixion narrative. He says now it's been consecrated or set apart, made holy for us through the veil of his flesh. We have a high priest over the house of God. So let's draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, having our hearts, what? Sprinkled, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, so he uses that analogy of as the priest would sprinkle in a purifying form. Maybe you were being cleansed from fungus in your house, or maybe you had some bodily ailment, uh, skin disease like leprosy, and then Leviticus 14. There was a purifying cleansing ritual at the end when that thing went away, see, or whatever it might have been. He uses this analogy of our hearts have been sprinkled from an evil conscience. Now watch this. 
and our body washed with pure water. Now that washed right there, that's luo, perfect passive participle. So the perfect tense means completed action. There's nothing more to do. There's no more washing to do. Having our, not bodies, by the way, it's so singular. My King Jimmy says bodies, but that's incorrect. The Greek is a singular. It's talking about the one body of Christ, the whole body of Christ, past, present, and future. Everybody that has come to Christ, is coming to Christ today, and will come to Christ in the future is considered in this bottom of verse 22. It is our, plural, body, singular, which is completely, perfectly washed, perfect tense, passive voice, right, without our involvement. I love it. It's a washing without our involvement. The action is taken to the subject without the subject's involvement. It is washed with a pure water as opposed to the impure water of what in this context? What, what do you think he'd be referring to relative to impure water? If Christ has washed the church with a pure, undefiled water, spiritually, right? That's set in, set in juxtaposition over against what kind of water? Sure, it's the sprinkling and ceremonialism that went on in the temple. So he's, he's not embracing it. He's pushing us away and pushing it away from us. See? All right. Now, having said all that, thank you, Lord, for that. Look at chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1, he starts talking about the first covenant, ordinances of divine service, and a worldly sanctuary. The idea of a shadow is present in the idea of, of worldly, and then he talks about there was, uh, if you go into the holy place in the tabernacle, there was the candlestick, the table uh, of showbread, which is called the holy place. And then there's the second veil, holiest of all. And he speaks about the golden censer in verse 4 and the ark of the covenant overlay with gold and the contents of the ark. That was what was inside the holy place. That golden censer is a reference to that handheld censer, censer that the priest, the high priest, would take in there once a year on the Day of Atonement, get all the smoke billowing up. They'd keep piling the incense in there on those hot coals, and he would take it inside and wave it around so the whole thing billowed, you know, maybe he had an oxygen mask on or something, I don't know. But the whole thing is billowed, and the idea was so that he could not see the glory of God as it manifested himself. Now, clearly, this is more type and shadow, because no amount of physical earthly smoke can stop that spiritual reality from coming through if there was something to be seen. But the point was not that you would actually physically see this and that, you know, you die or something like that. That's not the point. The point was to understand that God is so holy you are, and you are so unholy in your unatoned for state that you must not look upon me and I must not look upon you. He's not saying I can't see you, you know, because the eyes of the Lord run to and fro over the whole earth. He's saying you need to understand how holy I am and how unholy you are. That's why he emphasizes that. And then it talks about, uh, verse 6, there were priests that went into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service. Verse 7, under the second, went the high priest alone every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself for the sins of the people. Now, I know we've been here before, but let's just do it. Verse 8, the Holy Spirit, why, why was all this being done? Well, here's why. The Holy Spirit was then signifying, or deluo, making clear, the Holy Spirit making clear then that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, not available, while as the first tabernacle not was yet standing, but had standing. While the first tabernacle had standing. Ekuses sasin. It means, it, it's talking about not a physical erection of a building standing. It's talking about standing before God, that it had a place of respect before God. In other words, that was the way God was to be worshipped. It had standing at that point. He uses it in, in the simple past right here when he says, all this stuff went on while the first tabernacle had standing. Now, verse 9, which was a parabole, a parable. So the tabernacle temple situation was a parable to teach for the time then present. I think this is so powerful how he, he uses that. He says that first tabernacle had standing, but the implication then is what? 
he doesn't have standing anymore. Isn't that the implication? All right. Then he says, which was a figure, a parable, for the time then present, which implies that the time now present, the parable's over. Even though the physical uh, edifice was still standing in Jerusalem, if this book of Hebrews was written something like 64, maybe 65, something like that, just before the three and a half year tribulation began, it had standing, but just because the physical building was there doesn't mean it has a place before God anymore. Why? Because in AD 30, and April 7th of AD 30, when he said, it is finished, what happened in the temple? Yeah, that veil was torn, which meant what? Come on, right? Man, any, come on, come on. That's the cry of the gospel. Is you can get to God now. You know, you don't have to go through this system. That was for them. Thank God we've been freed from all of that, you see. So you can see he's building up, building up, saying no more physical. It's shadow. It was type. Now we have a greater reality, right? Now our body, the church, has been washed with what? A pure water, as opposed to the impure physical water that went on with ceremonial sprinklings, ceremonial washings. Okay. So verse 9, which was a parable for the time then present, in which both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him, that did the service of worship perfect as pertaining to conscience. In fact, according to chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, every time they'd sacrifice an animal, it brought a remembrance of their what? Yeah, their sins. It just reminded them every time they did it. See? Well, that sacrificial system is very much a part of all of the rest of the ceremonialism that went on in the temple, including the different types of baptisms or washings or sprinklings. It reminded one, the physical occurrence of that thing, reminded one that they were not clean, that they were impure. And that's the message that's being sent every time since A.D. 70, well, in particular A.D. 30, Every time we go to, to make a mandatory requirement of somebody to get baptized in water, dunking or sprinkling, whatever your mode of choice is, all you're doing is saying to them, God's remembering that you're an impure individual. Because there is no text of Scripture that says applying water to a person purifies an individual's conscience. That's his point here in the ninth chapter of Hebrews on into the tenth. Anything of a physical ceremonial nature does not free that individual. It does the opposite. It keeps them bound in heart and mind and spirit, bound by their sin and the inability to please God or come before him without severe consequences. So, verse 10, which stood only in meat and drink, that means the meal or food offerings, drink, uh, various wine offerings, libations that were poured upon the sacrifice. The word meat can cover everything from the actual flesh of the animals here, uh, or it could have to do with the oats, it could have to do with grain, it could have to do with wheat, part of the barley harvest, you know, that they would sacrifice, bring the tithe of that in, and that, that would be burned. Uh, some of it would be roasted, and then the priest would get a portion of that, to get his tenth from that, and that's how he got paid. He says, back then, this parable that was then present stood back then in these types of offering, and what's the next three words in verse 10? <laughs> what do you don't want to talk? <laughs> and... Verse 10, yeah, stood only in meats and drinks. And then what are the next three words? Various washings. There you go. Various or different kinds of wa I'm sorry, brother, go ahead. And regulations for the body. Yes, thank you. And different washings, chi, explanative conjunction, translated as and, right before the word carnal or fleshly, see? And carnal ordinances or rites or ceremonies or conjunctions, that'd be fine too. It is sarks. It means fleshly ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. So you've got different types of washings right here. It's baptismois, it's baptisms, it's the word, and it's translated as washings. Now the reason they would use the word washing in this ceremonial, Jewish ceremonial context, is because that's how they understood it. But the Jews still use the word baptism 
for their washings. It, it, it kind of comes and goes. It plays both directions here. So different kinds of washings. There were all kinds of washings. Uh, and this is now referring back to, depending upon what the sin was or what uh, you needed a ceremonial cleansing for relative to your house. Um, if an animal had died you know, on uh, uh, one of your pieces of furniture, there was a washing for that. Uh, there were washings in regards to skin uh, cleansings and, and uh, leprosies and all that. I've been through all this uh, with you already, so I just won't keep hitting it. The point being is that the Greek word is baptisms right here, and this stuff was then present, was a parable, was a part of the ceremonialism, verse, bottom of verse 8, when the tabernacle had standing. Why do we bring this over into the church? When there is no water baptism, water ablution ceremony, taught by Christ or any of the apostles or performed by any of them, and that includes Philip, because that was not a, a baptism as is understood today. That was a proselyte mikvah bath washing. That was a ceremonial cleansing relative to speaking for the beginning of a new life that was a part of Jewish ceremonialism that was never taught anywhere in the Old Testament, but came over into the Jews during the intertestamental period, the 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew. Did you want to say something, Steve? No, I was going to think about that shadow. About the shadow. What did Sam Frost say about that shadow? On that Sunday morning when we had that prayer. What did he say? The shadow it's kind of the same thing I'm saying right yeah, now, I think. The shadow was gone. And the... Yeah, no substance. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. The shadow was gone. Wasn't that good? Yeah, that was very That was very powerful. Very yeah, the shadow is gone. The reality has come. Something along those lines right there. And that's it. So water baptisms is part of the shadow. If you're still practicing it, you're basically declaring that the reality of a sure salvation in Christ is not yours. Let the Church of Christ people put that in their pipe and smoke it. Oh, I'm sorry, they're too holy to smoke. Okay, which stood only, verse 10, in meats, drinks, different washings, fleshly ordinances. That's a commentary on this thing. There were ordinances of the flesh imposed on them until the time of reformation or the time of the new order. And then it speaks in verse 11, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater, see, good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Oh, look, there's that phrase again. That's a good thing to mark. Not made with hands, not a shadow, which the Lord pitched and not man, not man, not hands, not a shadow. Say, not made with hands, bottom of 11, that is to say, not of this building. The, um, it's katesios right there. Uh, it should be not of this creation. In other words, it's not of this physical creation, katesios. Um, in a roundabout way, it is pointing back towards the temple because the context seems to indicate that. But it's not physical. That's why he uses katesios right there. And then he moves on uh, into other things. And so uh, that's important. Um, this text all by itself it can stand alone and trample any kind of uh, water ablution ceremony within the church since AD 30. It just stomps it to death. Questions, comments? Last passage. Now we're slipping over to 1 Peter, third chapter. This is the last place in all of the New Testament where the word baptism is is mentioned. That ought to be interesting. Somebody hearing me swallowing all that water on the CD. I got the mic right up here and I'm going, look, 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 look. First Peter, third chapter. Let's back it up to verse 18. For Christ also has once suffered for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. See, the resurrection was not a fleshly thing. I'm not saying that he was not raised in his physical body. He was. But it was in some kind of what we call a glorified state. Uh, he had gone through a metamorphosis, some kind of a change. But it was quickened or given life by the Spirit, not given life by the flesh. That's important. By which, verse 19, that is, by the Spirit, he went and preached unto the disembodied spirits that were in prison, down in the Hadean realm, uh, down in um, the, uh, the uh, uh, Sheol side, the, the torments side of Sheol or Hades. He preached unto those spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedience, or at one time 
were disobedient during the time of Noah, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, some hundred plus years, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved through water, or by water would be okay too. Uh, how were those eight souls saved through water? Did they come in contact? Think about this now. The ark itself, built the way it was, with pitch inside and out, just smeared all over this thing, keeping the water out entirely. Um, they were not immersed in it. That's not to say that there weren't times, probably, uh, when the, the torrents were so hard because of this judgment uh, that it didn't submerge on a couple of times, relative like, like a submarine would go down, because this thing was like a, just like a long, giant box, you know, long box, and it was perfect for floating, you know. Not great for navigating, but that wasn't the point. But my question is, did, did any of those eight ever come in contact with water? They never did, did they? They were safe in the ark, and that's a picture right there, isn't it? If you're in Christ, you're in the ark, you're in Christ, water's not going to come in contact with you, so why are you bringing it to you, you know? Even the waters of somebody's baptism. Why do you want to add to the scriptures? Bang. That's it right there. That's the, that's the shot that needs to be heard. That's it right there. Why are we adding to the scriptures? And so, wherein a few, that is eight souls, were saved through the water, the like figure whereunto ba even baptism does now also save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Christ. Now, maybe you've written this down at the top of verse 21, where it says the like figure. Anybody have the Greek word for that? Antitype. There you go. It's the Greek antitupos, antitype. It means that which corresponds. In other words, saved through water, baptism corresponds to salvation. That's the meaning here. And the ESV's got the word corresponds. Wonderful. Excellent. Yeah, well, if it is, then Paul's not inspired. Okay, so the antitype, that which corresponds to being saved through water, whereunto baptism does also now save us. Now, before we move along here, baptism does also now save us. Now, what, what gets uh, a water baptism people so hot and, and worked up and bothered is that this has just got to be a text about water baptism, because the word water is mentioned, of course, uh, at the bottom of verse 20, and uh, baptism is associated with it in 21. Um, first of all, uh, the very context in the next verse tells you that this is not water that's being applied to a person's skin, where it says, whereunto even baptism does also now save us, not the rupos, removal, of the dirt of the flesh. So immediately, he's eliminating the idea that the baptism he's talking about that saves is the kind where water comes in contact with the skin and removes dirt. He says, no, it's not that. The word not needs to be put, you know, in a big, bold capital letters right there. Not the removal of the dirt of the flesh. So with that being said, back up a little bit, if the antitupos, or that which corresponds to uh, being saved through water or by water, is baptism that now saves us, and since a water baptism was never taught by Christ or by any of his disciples, and every time somebody was baptized, it's clearly a baptism with the Holy Spirit, which began on the day of Pentecost and moved its way through all of the book of Acts and all of the epistles, and since Ephesians 4, 5 says there's only one baptism, just like there's only one Jesus and only one God the Father, you can't have two Jesuses, three God the Fathers, and three or four different water baptisms. As Paul is saying, there's only one faith, one spirit, one Lord, one baptism. Then the one baptism that saves us, that delivers us, is, of course, the 1 Corinthians 12, 13 baptism, which is directly related to the Acts 2, 38, and 39 baptism. Acts 2, 38, 39. Remember, the, the promise, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit that brings forgiveness, is what he commands them to be baptized unto, right? 
Go ahead, Steve. No, I was just going to say, you know, what, the, what did you say here a while back when I said that the Church of Christ said that uh, the one, the one, the um, uh, you know, they say that water, oh, the only baptism there is is the washing uh, of immersion. And that's the reason why when it says one Lord, one faith, one baptism, they don't mean one baptism. They mean one baptism, the type or the act of baptism is only one and meaning immersion. Yeah. Um, if that's the case, then the word baptism right there should have been presented as an adjective, but it's a noun, just like Lord is a noun. It's not a type of Lord. It's not a type of one God the Father. I mean, if they're, if they're going to press that and they're going to use that, then that means, the, that means they're going to let that be taken off in a direction that they don't want it to go. If there's only one spirit and they're going to say one baptism, well, they just mean a type of baptism, well, that means there can just be a type of, of spirit. So there could be more than one spirit. There could be more than one faith. Oh, one faith? Oh, that's just a certain type of faith. There are many types of faith. And now we have the Obama Nation religion going on. You know, yeah. So obviously that's illegitimate. You know, and that's just once again that's somebody that's being held on by their presuppositions. This is what they want it to mean, and they're willing to change the word of God and bring sin and judgment upon them by putting their hands on God's word like this, by putting their hands on God's word. What do you What do you think of somebody like myself, who says things to you that you haven't heard before, and you, you haven't seen before? I'm no big deal. I'm pastoring this small group of precious souls, and I'm saying things that nobody says. Well, what I was going to well, and I'm glad. <laughs> That's good. But um, I was going to say, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's got to be a little scary. It, it's scary because, it, yeah, you said it earlier, it's because people want to be part of this bigger group. Great. It's not to say that not bigger groups could not be the same as we here. But... No, that's true. I think that the church will come to this. You know, but I mean, it's like, I mean, you've you got to know that I, I question myself every day. I, I talk to the Lord about this. I, I, I don't just go over this once or twice. I'm going over it all the time because I realize feet of clay. You know, I could, I could be blowing it here. I've blown it before. And God's just been so merciful to me in correcting me. And then that means I got to get up in front of all you and ask for your forgiveness for leading you down the wrong path. I, I think there was probably looks to me like within the New Testament here, these writings, that there was these this debate was actually going on back then. Interesting. The fact that Paul says, I didn't do it, I that he, the fact that he denies it means that this was probably people going around baptizing people with water and thinking this is a you need to do this. See, I have thought that too. I haven't, I haven't spoken it yet. I'm glad you brought that up. I've been thinking about the exact same thing. And, and in fact, I think I've read some different commentators that have talked about that, pointed out that possibility. You know, but I mean, it's like, speaking of which, that, that passage right there, I mean, 1 Corinthians 1, 12 through 17 right there. So, man, when I first started seeing that, you know, I was going, oh, I've got to be wrong about that. I've, I must be mistaken about that. And um, but usually I go right and do the Greek exegesis and I'll, you know, diagram my sentences. And, uh, but I thought, let's just see. Let me just pull down. You know, I've got this big old Bible Works 5 program on my computer. It does all the Greek and the Hebrew and zips you around and, you know, gets you right into the, book, the marrow of the word, you know. And I've got, uh, what, 30 some odd different translations, you know, and I'm looking at every one of them. And all of them say the exact same thing. Young's literal translation is a little bit more in my corner, but he stands out, you know, as opposed to everybody else. And I'm going, okay, well, the majority are again me right there. So then I go to my shelves, and I have another 30 Bibles there. So I start pulling down the ones I don't have on my computer, and I'm looking at all those, and I can't find one of them that agrees with me, not one anywhere, okay? Then I'm thinking, okay, uh, let's see what the commentators say, and now you start doing this diligence, you know, and, and I'm just pulling them down and pulling them down and pulling them down and pulling them down. Nobody, nothing, nothing, nothing. But brother, I will go to my grave knowing 
that I did an upright job on the grammar and the syntax of those and in accordance to the context. I'm not moving. And I got to stand before God. You know, I'm scared. Not because I think I might be wrong, but it's fear of him that keeps me from going with the crowd, to be honest with you, which can be, you know, I mean, there are cult people that do that. So you got to keep your eye on me. <laughs> there are people, there are people like you're talking about in the mega churches, but I think if you got them in a small group like this here, uh, and out of the pulpits in those big churches where they're pastoring thousands of people, I think they would agree with us. But since they're in the pulpits of those churches, they got to, you know, if any of those guys would change their mind and be true to what they really believe, uh, they'd lose their job. That's I right. Know. I don't think there's any question of that. It's, it's, it really is. Uh, is that right? Well, I think that's probably true. And that's, what, that's everything that's wrong about those places. I mean, it's one of the big things that's wrong with it. Is that you go to church to be entertained and feel good. And you don't, and it's, but they're doing good things for the Lord in some way. They are. They are. See, you know, it's hard for me to, to wrap my arms around that kind of a statement. Because I, I'm so concentrated on the error that's going out of the pulpit, what I perceive to be error. And if everything flows from the teaching ministry of the pastorate there, it's got to affect, error has to multiply itself on down. And it's got to affect other things. I mean, let's say you've got, let's say they're, they got this great, you know, feeding ministry. You know, they got milk going out to new mamas, you know, and they're, they're sheltering people. All that's great. But if your doctrine is wrong, is that going to, what is that going to spiritually net to be at the Bema judgment seat? What will that be? How will that net itself if you've got a different Jesus and a different gospel? I'm not talking about just the sin of futurism and holding to that. I'm talking about changing Jesus, or like you've pointed out, and Mike's pointed out, changing the word. And let's not rock the boat, you know, because I'll tell you what, man, I'm absolutely convinced that these Bible translations, there was a real shift. Carrie and I were just talking about this the other day. There was a real shift in attitudes of Bible translations when the NIV came on the scene back in 1972. Actually, it was, you know, back in the early 60s, the first NIV stuff started getting published in partial form. I think the Gospel of John was the first to go out. Then they worked on the epistles and then some other things. The Old Testament came last. But my version is the 1972, 73 version or something like that. And we were just going over 1 Peter, the third chapter, the other night. Man, they have removed words. They have left other Greek words untranslated, added to it. Meanings have been changed, clouded over. Ever since then, there has been a, a glut of translations on the market since the 70s that are all in competition with one another. And they're in competition with one another for one thing and one thing only. That's why they exist. It's a business. Then why don't four or five, six pastors get together and, uh, and rewrite it? Because then you got to get into copyright laws. But why don't they rewrite it and get the proper Bible? It's just like software, computer software, computers, anything. It's supply and demand. You know what I mean? If, if they don't change it and completely redo it now, they can do a slow process along the way and it gets people purchasing all this stuff, purchasing, purchasing, repro. So why don't we come out in the name of, of Christendom here and, and get a Bible that's totally accurate? Well, you know, brother, I, I but, the short answer to that is, yeah, why don't we? That's the short answer to that. You know, the reality is, uh, is... The Net Bible might be close. I was, gonna, I was just thinking about the Net Bible when you were saying that. The Net Bible is that way. I don't like the translation, but I, I think the, the notes are fantastic. Um, you know, this is a major, major time-consuming effort. Um, if we're pastors, you just don't have time. We just don't have time. I couldn't get it done in the rest of my... I can't, I can't... Yeah, and find me a dozen men, a dozen godly men who are not influenced, you know, by the, the seminaries and the thinking of Christianity of our times, who can think like Puritans. Give me, give me a dozen godly men. 
give me six experts in Greek and six experts in Hebrew, you know, who love Jesus and hate all of this and, and respect the word like the King, the King James people did. Well, that's, my, that's what I'm saying. But the editorial staff of the New King James, <coughs> 35, 40 people. <coughs> Yeah, and they got a ton of money too. Yeah, you know, those people got to be paid. You know, now let's take take someone like me for a second. We need to stop. Let's take somebody like me for a second. I I, I I'm the pastor here. You know, and I I wouldn't be pa- I couldn't pastor here if I took on a uh, a thing like that. I could not pastor here, and that's not an excuse. So if you that's to, legitimate. If you have to take that staff and you build that staff for your own. Would you have to? Would the whole staff have to be full preterist? No. Would you, you'd have some dispensational people in there too? No, because that's, a, that's another, that's a dog of a different flea. <laughs> that's a hermeneutic that uh, uh, is without respect to the text. It's without respect. No, yeah, no. So, big stuff. We'll just leave all that stuff on the water. So you'd have to have a staff CD. Like Gary North and these guys. No, I don't like them either. <laughs> 